day of my actions uh, for the Medal of Honor um, really started two days prior. Uh, we'd been out on a five-day mission called Rock Avalanche. Uh, it was a battalion-wide mission. We had a thousand infantry moving up a couple different valleys, uh, and we were just one piece of it. Uh, the day prior, our scout team got overran, and uh, the scout team leader was killed, Sergeant Larry Rugel, uh, and they also cleared his body, and they, they took the gear. And this was the first time that, in my experience, uh, in the unit in, in combat that they had access to our, our fallen uh, that I've ever heard of or seen. And so the next day, 2nd Platoon went out to go set in and talk to the villagers and see if they couldn't get any information about our equipment. We set in on an overwatch above them and then we had 3rd Platoon, a piece of 3rd Platoon above us. Um, we sat there all day. We walked out. It took us maybe two, two and a half hours to walk out. We sat in before the sun came up. We, 360 degree parameter, you know, we're all awake, we're, we're just watching, listening, making sure nothing happens to second down below, making sure nothing happens to third above us, just watching our surroundings. And I don't know, maybe 14 hours later or so, the sun had gone down, so an entire day span, uh, the sun cycle in October. Uh, we started breaking down and walking back and because the way the train was, it just dropped off on both sides. The only way back that we could go was the way we came. And we, we came up the mountain on our hands and knees that last bit, so we were going to have to do some sliding. Uh, but we walked maybe 200 meters, 400 meters from uh, where we had sat all day, the 18 of us. And we were walking in a single file line, you know, 10 to 15 meters between people. So, you know, one grenade takes out a group. And uh, it just... The world exploded on us, RPGs, PKMs, uh, small arms fire, uh, grenades, everything was happening and it, and it all was initiated from our left, from our west side, from at, from only maybe 30 meters away. Uh, right on the crest of the hill, we were walking our military ridge off the top, but they were on the top uh, on the other side. And their ambush line span, I, as far as I could see, uh, you know, the length of our patrol line. Um, and when that happened, I, I dropped down. My first responsibility is to my guys. I was a team leader. And I look back and I remember Casey and Clary. Uh, Casey's just standing there shooting, shooting the M249 saw, uh, not taking cover, creating, I mean, he looked like a, a dragon blowing fire at night with a shooting cyclic in the dark. Um, and Clary was already on the ground shooting 203s. This whole time, the ambush line, it was kind of strange because our tracers are different colors than theirs. And so, you know, we're shooting orange tracers this way and they're shooting green tracers back this way. Uh, but, you know, between every one of those tracers, it's probably about four bullets you're not seeing. And it was the entire sky was filled up with tracers. Uh, knowing that I can't direct people doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, I, I, they're doing everything they can. I look forward to my leader, uh, Staff Sergeant Eric Gallardo. And when I first saw him, I saw his head twitch and he, and he went down. Um, and he's maybe 15 yards further north than me and maybe another 5, 10 yards closer to the ambush line, just the way we were walking. And when I saw that, I just thought, I thought I knew what happened and I just didn't want to see anything more happen because of him laying there. And so I got up and I ran and I grabbed him. And when I was grabbing him, uh, I was shot in my vest on my right side, kind of turned away from where all the shooting was, was primarily coming from, um, which was interesting because we should have had two more guys up there, uh, Eckrod and Brennan. And I dragged Gallardo back to where Casey and Clary were. Um, and as I was dragging him back, he, he started kicking to his feet and the bullet had hit his helmet and he was fine. And uh, he said, we're throwing grenades, and so we, we threw grenades towards the ambush line. We pushed further north to link up with uh, Casey, or I'm sorry, to link up with Eckrode and uh, Brennan. And the whole time, Casey and Clary are still firing. I, I only had three grenades on me that I carried with me as a team leader with everything else that I carried. And when I threw my last grenade, we came up on Eckrode. And so 
I had already thrown my last grenade and we still had to go further forward, we still had to push further forward and Gallardo peeled off to Eckrode and knowing that Gallardo was with Eckrode, uh, Eckrode was down on the ground, he was shot a couple of times, but he also had the SAL, the, the 249, one of our mass casually producing weapons that we needed shooting like now. Um, and as I got farther forward, I didn't, I, where Brennan, where I would assume where he would have been, he wasn't at. Uh, and I've served my entire first tour was with him as well. We've been in the Army almost the same length of time. So we'd been together in the Army for five and a half years at this point. Uh, he was Alpha team leader. I was Bravo team leader. And ultimately, uh, in a near ambush situation, the answer is charge the ambush line. Uh, and I know this. We all know this. That's, that's basic training. That's battle drill. Um, it's easier said than done, but I knew that that's where Brennan must have gone. If he wasn't there, he didn't wait for us. He did what had to be done. And so I ran to follow Brennan. And I got into this flat, eerie, well, I don't know if it was eerie. It doesn't have to be eerie. It's eerie in my mind. This flat area on top of a mountain when it's been a ridge this entire time. And there was no trees on it. And uh, I saw two guys carrying guy between him by his hands and by his legs and they were running away and uh, they were past the ambush line where, where the actual line of attack was they were past that and so I started running to him and I didn't understand who had got here before me why they were running that way I, I couldn't see I didn't have my nods down the the moon was it was almost a full moon so the loom was incredible without any electricity in the valley um, and as I got closer, I, I saw that it was two, uh, whatever you want to call them, enemy combatants carrying uh, Sergeant Brennan. And so I did what I was trained to do, close with and destroy the enemies of the United States. And I did that. And uh, I grabbed Brennan and started running back the direction that I had just come from. We were, we were probably on the side of the ambush line, on the line of attack, so it made it real, it was a dangerous position for for me to do anything for him. And it was dangerous to move any further down because then I would be on, on, on the ambush line, on the enemy ambush line. But right about that time was when the, the enemy ambush line uh, started to break down and I brought Brennan back maybe 20 yards, 30 yards. And I put him in a, in a low, it was like a water washout coming down the side of the mountain. Uh, and then Casey was there and Brennan, or uh, Casey was there and Clary was there and Gallardo showed up uh, and started setting up a perimeter around us. And as the enemy ambush line broke, we had two Apache helicopters uh, above us the entire time. But because of the, the proximity of, of the contact, they couldn't, they couldn't do anything. But once the enemy ambush uh, broke down, they created that space. And then the Apaches pretty much took everyone. I don't think anyone on that ambush line on the enemy side came out. Um, and then I worked on Brynn and I tried to uh, assess his wounds and, and reassure him he was alive. Um, he was missing part of his, his lower face, his lower jaw. Um, more than likely, I mean, looking at it after the fact and, and all the stories that come through that it was an L-shaped ambush and he would, Brennan was walking point. He walked into the apex of it, so he took the brunt of it. They took his rucksack, they took his helmet, they took his gun, his uh, small D, we each carried small Ds. Uh, they, they took most all of that uh, and he shot several times, arms and his legs, his face was seriously wounded, uh, but he was alive. And then uh, I, we called that up, uh, I passed the word on, Gallardo called that up and then we had a medic from 3rd Platoon. Our medic, uh, I've called for a medic quite a few times. And I've never had him not show up. And that night our medic didn't show up, uh, Special Hugo Mendoza, because he was killed within the first couple seconds uh, of the ambush. So the medic that came was, 3rd Platoon's medic showed up and we also had uh, a male nurse with us, Sergeant Brothers, and they were both there uh, and working on Brennan. And then the rest of uh, the ponchos kind of started coming in. None of us knew you know, what was really going on. We only knew this small section. I knew what, I knew what happened with Casey and Clary at the start, and then I saw him at the end, but the in-between was, no one really knows uh, for any of us. And then 
kind of that consolidation of folks and the helicopters coming in and, and sending the wounded and the, the killed off and divvying up the ammo and, and carrying the extra guns back and actually, uh, you know, it was probably a two hour walk back and to feel that weight of, you know, the loss that the guys we just had moments ago or an hour ago and we were sitting there waiting for something to happen and then uh, to know we don't have them and, and the un uncertainty of what will happen and, and how many of those guys will come back. Uh, we got back and we were told that uh, Specialist Mendoza had died um, in the ambush and uh, Sergeant Brennan had died in, in surgery and uh, Eckrode was gonna be fine. And Eckrode was gonna come back uh, and the other folks were gonna be fine. Uh, not necessarily coming back, but it it was just another day in Afghanistan. I mean, that's, that's kind of what you expect is the unexpected. Uh, I can't say that there's anything special about that day for me. Uh, if there was the only thing that made that day stand out in my life is the recognition. Uh, but I stand, I stood on that mountain with 17 other guys that day, with a lot of other guys, 17 just in my platoon. And uh, we all went into it together and we all did the best we could. So, you know, it's not my special day. That's what we did. The day that I had actually received the Medal of Honor from the president uh, and, and the guys that were with me on the mountain that day stood up and, and the families of Sergeant Brennan and Specialist Mendoza were there and, and people who had given so much to this uh, and see them be recognized was awesome. Uh, but it was terrible because I was also the only one standing on the stage uh, and that's not how I, I wanted it. And my first year of uh, having the medal uh, was really difficult. I felt very awkward. I felt very out of place. I felt very nervous and very um, undeserving, and I didn't know how to handle it. And I look at some of the other things I've done in the past, and I can see it on my face, and it was because I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable with it. Uh, I've read stories of people who've received the Medal of Honor, and they are just amazing, and I'm just sal. Uh, and if you're going to tell this story, and it's worthy of a Medal of Honor, we got to talk about my friends. we got to talk about the people that were there with me, and uh, so often I'm the one that receives the congratulations or the pats on the back or the thank you for your service and uh, my story, I've never done it alone. Not once, not twice. I've never been to combat alone. I've never been in a gunfight alone. I've done this with uh, someone to the left of me and to the right of me and now these last three years I, I've stood very much singled out um, and I'm working with trying to show the average person that there's so many people just like me and the only reason why you think I'm special is because I was recognized but not because what I did was special it's what we expect of every single man and woman in uniform today that has been fighting this war for the last 13 years please if you're gonna use my face that's fine and you want to associate me with all of them that's great but please don't think that I am special uh, and I say it as much as I can and I try to portray that through my actions and uh, I've become more comfortable with it but it is definitely harder to wear the Medal of Honor than it is to receive the Medal of Honor. I did my job to receive the Medal of Honor. This is, this is just trying to represent the, the best, the bravest, the smartest, the fastest, the most selfless people I've ever met. And it just so happens they didn't really give me an option. Uh, so trying to make the most positive impact I can while I have the opportunity to do it.